so this talk is about the Ten Commandments of Continuous Delivery or deployment, equally applicable to all. Uh, my name is Victor. I work for CloudBees. I'm also one of the Docker captains, so my main interests are around continuous integration, continuous delivery, containers, Jenkins, of course, and so on and so forth. A couple of books which you should buy immediately. <laughs> and we can start, right? So the first question is why am I here? Uh, as in San Francisco, so I went, um, before I came here, I went to Mountain uh, to have some time alone, clear up my mind, rest a bit and stuff like that. And then actually everything went to, went to blaze. I guess that this is American equivalent of burning bush. Everything needs to be bigger in this country. <laughs> right, anyway, uh, I had epiphany. I heard a voice speaking to me and told me that you guys went astray. You really need to correct your behavior. He gave me a couple of rocks, which I couldn't bring with me. Tablets, they say it can be used as a weapon, so I'm coming uh, in electronic version today to you guys. Uh, before I continue, everything I say does not represent what my company believes in. It does not even represent what I think. This is his word, okay? So if you have a problem, if you get offended or anything like that, don't come to me, come go to him. Just to make it clear. So everything, everybody is practicing here continuous delivery, right? Who, who, is, who is doing continuous delivery here? Only one third, what, what's wrong? This is Silicon Valley, you're all supposed to be kind of like the best in the world and everything. Okay. Uh, Anyway, when I speak with people, it's usually kind of everybody is either starting to do continuous delivery or they are already doing it and they are, most of them are lying, uh, inventing. So let's, let's go quickly what continuous delivery is. You probably already know, so I will be very brief. The idea is that you have a fully automated process from commit to production, right? No humans involved. You have maybe one button that says deploy to production. Uh, or not, depending on whether you're doing continuous delivery or continuous deployment. But the point is that there is, it is fully automated. When a developer is the last one in the chain of humans doing something, he does a commit, goes to production, as simple as that. It's very hard to get there, but the logic is relatively simple. So no humans after that commit. And every, every commit that is green, every commit that passed, your automated pipeline is deployable to production. If it's not, then you're not doing it. You're not doing continuous delivery, nor do you're doing continuous deployment. So I have no picture here because it, it should be offensive. Uh, I'm gonna sp speak about teenage lovemaking. Uh, at least when I was young, everyone talked about it. <laughs> when I was in high school, everybody talked about love. Um, nobody really ever knew how to do it. That, that's how it worked when I was young. <laughs> now the problem with that is that everybody thought that everybody else was doing it. <laughs> everybody. And therefore, everybody needed to claim that they are doing it as well because you don't want to be the only nerd not doing it. Then you end up being software engineer when you grow up. <laughs> that's what happens. And continuous integration, continuous delivery, DevOps and all those things are to me like sex in high school, love making in high school. I'm not allowed to say sex, I guess. Uh, everybody's claiming they're all, your CTO probably went to some Gardner meeting and Gardner said you should do continuous delivery and you're all doing it, right? So why do we want them? Why do we want continuous delivery? We want to reduce deployment risk. There is that false, that is that false idea that if we did deliver something to production every half a year, that's secure, that's, that's simply not right. It's uh, more secure, there is less risk when we deploy often. If I deploy only three lines of, new lines of code, that's not risky. If I deploy uh, half a year of work, that's, that's, that's not a risk even, that's, a, that's, that's insanity. Increased speed of delivery, we, are, so we can deliver realistically every day, we can deliver every hour if you trust the system that will pass that commit throughout the whole pipeline. We get faster user, user feedback, right? And that's very important. We are all agile now, probably, hopefully. And uh, we understand that 
we cannot just plan some project for half a year and say we're gonna deliver it after half a year and everybody's gonna like it. We have no idea whether that's gonna happen. We need to deliver to our users every day, see their feedback, and continue and plan next. And we have finally, this is one of my favorites, real definition of done. Because most of you are probably doing sprints and you have definition of done and the end of the sprint is done, right? Kind of done and then why don't you put it to production because it's not safe, it's not really done, right? When you put it to production and when it works, then it's truly done. That's the only definition of done you can have. Everything else is just faking it. Yes, I did some code, right, it's done. Nobody knows whether it works. Increased quality, decreased costs, and um, finally, once we automate everything, my presentation goes off. Uh, when we automate everything, then we can actually start working on things that bring real value. Because you guys doing, uh, repeating the same deployment steps or uh, executing the ma same manual tests over and over again and doing the repetitive things over and over again, that brings no value to you, that brings no value to your companies. Machines can do that. What machines cannot do is to think, they cannot be creative. That's what we do and let everything else be part of our pipeline. So continuous delivery, you would want it almost certainly because that's the reason why you're here. You probably, some of you claim you're doing it. I will prove during this presentation that you're probably faking that you're doing it. Or you're in a very small minority of people who actually are. So let's see the 10 commandments. Start for the first one. Thou shalt be agile. As I said, this is not me, that's him. So how many of you are agile here? Work in agile, yeah? And how many of you have departments? How many of you have QA departments, infrastructure department? Then you're not agile, it's impossible. It's contradictory. You're faking it. You cannot have departments if you wanna do continuous anything. Continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. And the reason is very simple. Departments means hands off. Hands off, I, I do my code, I give it to you to test, uh, open a Jira ticket and then I open another Jira ticket to get it deployed and then next week I might see something in production. You cannot, if you have silos, if you have departments, you cannot do continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, anything that starts with continuous. You need to get rid of those, you need to become truly agile. What getting rid of those does not mean that you do not have specialty. You can continue being a developer, a tester, infrastructure, whatever you are, or all of those, but you need to work inside of a cross-functional team, not inside of your department because I think that Jess Humble was speaking about the same concept. You have a product, you have a team, you deliver that product, you build it, you run it, everything is done by you, by your team, not handed to somebody else, not handed to some other department. If that is happening, you really cannot, cannot proceed even further. So, then you need to start thinking about refactoring. I think that, at least those of you who are developers here, if you don't spend at least one third of your time refactoring, you're not doing your job well. You cannot just develop new features. For those of you who might not know, refactoring means changing code, improving code without adding, new, adding any new feature. You need to refactor. And if you wanna do continuous something, you will most likely need to refactor your application in a drastic measures because it needs to be buildable, it needs to be testable, it needs to be deployable and so on and so forth. If it's 20 years old, 10 years old, monolithic big application most likely does not fit in any of those criteria. And that means that you will have to probably spend endless hours redesigning your application. Simply it's not, I mean, any application older than 10 years is it just bollocks, it's, 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 it's awful, it doesn't, doesn't work. So, you need to, ref it's a piece of art. You need to re-architecture re that, your application, and then uh, simply make it, I will speak a bit more later how, but make it more buildable, more testable, and you need to adopt a couple of other practices. Now, this is also one of my favorites, thou shalt educate others. Meaning, who, how many of you have continuous deployment or continuous delivery or DevOps department? Do you have those departments? 
That's awful. You cannot have those. You cannot. The point is not, again, going back to cross-functional team, the point is not for you to build pipelines for others. The point is that others should in, in put those pipelines as part of their processes. They need to write it. You can write helper methods, you can write helper functions, you can do all those things. You cannot write pipelines for your team, uh, for other teams, simply because you have no idea what they're doing. You're not into their technology. And even if, if you do know what they're doing, even if you do write it successfully, first of all, probably it's gonna be Uber pipeline of 50,000 lines of, of uh, some GUI scripts and stuff like that. Second, they will not understand what that pipeline does and they will not architecture their code accordingly. And you will have their mis miscommunication and then it will, it, will fail, uh, uh, it will fail big time. So yeah, and, and that's kind of, that's a problem I, I'm seeing all the time. I'm, I'm very often called to, to, to visit companies to educate their CD department, continuous deployment, deployment, which is, by the way, CD department is the same CI department that was renamed into CD, the same way as your uh, Scrum masters are managers that change the title, right? <laughs> um, so really, you need to, the only, the only thing that you can do is, is that department or those people is just to educate your teams. They are cross-functional. Remember that they need to do everything, including their pipelines. They need to understand how to do it. Next, you need to be small. That means that your applications, your big application cannot, cannot really fulfill those requirements for a couple of reasons. First, if it's big, it takes a long time to, to test, takes a long time to build, takes a long time to refactor, it takes a long time to do whatever. Second, if it's a big application, that means big teams. And the whole idea behind microservices are teams. You cannot have more than eight people in a cross-functional team capable of doing something from the beginning to the end. Anything more than eight, that's a school reunion. That's not anymore a group of engineers doing. That's not a team anymore. And there is a strong reason why microservices are becoming popular last maybe five years, six years with the emergence of containers and with the emergence of continuous delivery deployment and all those things, simply because they fit together. One without the other will not work. It will fail miserably if you have, I don't know, just mentioned COBOL applications or whatever uh, Java monolithic application or whatever you're doing right now. So, and that's, that, that's pretty much in line with, uh, with the cross-functional teams I was mentioning before. They need to be fully capable of everything, doing everything from the beginning to the end. Next one, those shall practice TDD, test-driven development for those of you who don't know acronyms. It's impossible to do continuous, even continuous integration without test-driven development. It, I mean, it's possible, but it's just silly because if a commit initiates a pipeline and that pipeline does things and at the end of that process says it's green, this works. If there are no tests that accompany that commit, you're just testing nothing. It will always be green. So tests needs to be part of every commit. They must be part of any commit. Now you can choose to, to execute, uh, to write tests before you write code or after you write code. If you write tests after code, it's just silly because those tests are never be valid. They're just gonna confirm whatever policy somebody wrote in code. You wanna write tests before code, so that tests are kind of requirements of what, what you wanna do. And uh, you can choose unit testing, uh, TDD, behavior-driven development, uh, acceptance-driven development, same thing, diff different names. The point is that you write tests before you write your code because tests are the only requirements that are valid and without tests, your pipeline is just invalid. It will always be green. Actually, very often it's not green even without tests. I don't know how people accomplish that, but <laughs> it just happens, I guess. Next one, like, uh, and it still happens. I, I don't know what's, what's, ro what's wrong with people. Everybody likes clicking with mouse. Mouse is kind of the most popular tool in software industry still for some reason, right? So you, 
many people still love freestyle draws because freestyle draws allow you to click there, 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 and click there, and then you have something running, right? And the more important benefit of freestyle jobs, there is a benefit, is that you can fake that you know what you're doing. You have no idea, you don't know what Maven is, but there is a plugin. It will do something with Maven. You need to run Ansible, you have no idea what Ansible is, there is a plugin. That simply does not work. We proved it, ESBs were very popular 15 years ago, all UIs based, we are not using them anymore. 20 years ago, everybody used uh, I IDs that uh, allow you to drag and drop something and then automatically you, you get HTML pages. We don't do that anymore. And we need to apply the same thing to Jenkins. You need to adopt Jenkins pipeline. There is no real reason why you shouldn't, except, I mean, there might be one reason you don't know how to code. But if you don't know how to code, then I don't know what you're doing here. Then really, you should become a doctor or a lawyer. And it's easier. <laughs> it really is. So you need to code, you need to write your pipeline as code, you need to put it in, in, into repository where your services, not centralized in Jenkins, that, that's also being thing of the past. And uh, after all, you're gonna discover some other things, but what you have to do as well is to adopt all the practices that the rest of the world is doing. Pull requests, code reviews, repository, and all those things. And that's what pipelines give you. Now, it can be Jenkins, you're most likely Jenkins because you're on Jenkins conference, but pipelines are available almost anywhere. So that shouldn't be a big of a surprise. Next one, you should have a fast pipeline. How long should the pipeline be? That's kind of like you ask me and I answer. Um, if, if a pipeline, if execution of a pipeline takes more than 15 minutes, you will have a huge failure. For a simple reason, you will waste a lot of time. And the reason is very simple. Developer, when he makes a commit to your repository, uh, to his repository, he's about to start working on a new feature. When he starts working on a new feature, he should be uninterrupted with that because what we do is difficult. We need to be concentrated. And your pipeline needs to give feedback before he goes uh, and starts doing something else. If it takes two hours to execute pipeline, that means that I'm gonna make that commit, start working on something else, get the notification that pipeline failed after an hour, stop doing whatever I'm doing, go back and fix the code, and then spend another hour trying to, to remember where I was two hours ago because I, 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 I was interrupted and so on and so forth. So my measure of execution time of a pipeline is coffee time. How much time you need to go lift, get out up from your desk, go to a kitchen, make yourself coffee, drink it, maybe chat with somebody on your way back and start working on something else. 15 minutes or if you're in Spain, one hour. Approximately. That's how long it, it should take. Anything else is just, and I see that also all the time, often people tell me we cannot have a pipeline that does everything, building, testing, deployment, and so on and so forth in 15 minutes. And if that's true, then you go back to my work of art. That's why not. That's the reason. You need to re-architecture your code, you need to rechange how you're doing things. And once you do that, it will be doable in 15 minutes or less. And after all, if it takes hours, how are you gonna do every commit? If you make a commit one every, every hour and your pipeline takes three hours, then you do the calculation how long all that takes. And, and the reason for having high importance of a very fast pipeline comes in this command, and thou shalt consider fixing a failed path pipeline as the highest priority. And what will happen is that if it takes a couple of hours to execute whatever you're executing, then no developer, when he receives notification that it failed, will stop doing what he's doing and fix that. You're just gonna start ignoring, ignoring failures, as you probably do. So, it is very important to understand that there is nothing more important in the world but fixing a failed, a failure of a pipeline, simply because 
if you don't fix it now, it will cost you much more later because I, I remember what I did 15 minutes ago, it's easy for me to fix it. If I fix it three days later, I have no idea, my memory is not that good. So high, uh, fixing a failure is always the highest priority. And please don't use sonar. Please don't, uh, don't, don't have those rules like only 20% of test cases are failing. We're good. If it reaches 30, we need to do something. <laughs> it needs to be binary. It works or it doesn't. You cannot deploy to production something that maybe works. It, it, it does or it doesn't. So fixing a failed, fa failed build, build, fixing a failed pipeline is the highest priority. There are two exceptions to that being highest priority. If your office is burning, or if your mom calls you to tell you about the new episode of a soap opera. Anything else? <laughs> Means that you fix it first, develop later. Those shall run C the CD pipeline locally. You cannot say Jenkins does everything. Jenkins should uh, do everything, and that, that's what Jenkins is designed. But that is not excuse for you not to do almost the same what Jenkins is doing locally. It is embarrassing to say, I bash some code and I commit and let's see whether it builds. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. You need to build run tests and all those things locally first, then commit and have Jenkins do the final verification. Maybe do hard things like uh, performance tests and so on and so forth. But committing code that you did not test locally should be illegal, to say the least. Because among other things, it is disrespectful to your colleagues. Because your colleagues are gonna make a, may, uh, make a new branch, make a fork your code, that you yourself don't know whether it works. And that brings us to, to, to how you write pipelines. If you once, you, once you figure out and understand how to run everything locally, creating Jenkins pipeline will be easy much easier than freestyle jobs. And finally, the last one, thou shalt commit to the master branch only. Continuous integration is about committing to master. Branches are irrelevant, branches are evil. Branches mean that you don't trust your process. If you trust your process, if you trust that that pipeline will detect a problem, there is no reason for you not to commit to master. Because what is happening is that if you make a branch and, co and commit to that branch for a week, a month, a year, you're de that's not continuous uh, delivery deployment integration. That's delayed something because that's how much you're delaying verification whether your code integrates with everybody else's. So master is the only thing that matters. Now, if you like branches, that's great. Make feature branches, make them live for a day, not longer and then merge back to master and deploy to production. Otherwise, it's kind of, you can, you, you can set up whatever pipeline you want until that goes to master, it's irrelevant what you did, at least from the process point of view. So master is the only thing that truly, really matters. Everything else is just uh, hiding behind validations of your work. So he, not me, you need to be agile, but when you say agile, you need to be truly agile, not, not like my CTO went to a Gardner meeting, Gardner said be agile, and then everybody five levels before your CTO became agile, which is kind of a developer and a cleaning lady. You, show, you will refactor your code, and you will adopt refactoring as something that is part of your process. Every day spend at least two, two hours not delivering new features, but refactoring, improving what you have. Otherwise, you end up with that big pile of something that you don't want to look at. And that's okay. Y we all have legacy systems. Legacy system, by the way, is a system without tests. That's, that's the definition of legacy system. If you hear no, no tests, it's legacy because without tests, you cannot refactor. I mean, it would be insane to refactor without tests because how do you know that it works? And that's why they are so, so important. Shall educate everybody, teach them how to how to do the process, don't do the process for them. Don't create pipelines for other teams. You can help them how to do, the, do it themselves. The same way as you're not going to write their code, you're not going to write their tests. Those teams should do all those things. 
It should be small, up to eight people. Anything bigger than eight is a sacrilege, not allowed. He says it, you follow. Practice test, test driven development. It's very hard. Test driven development is probably the hardest practice there is. It will take you half a year, maybe a year until you say, oh, look, this makes sense. But once you do, you will realize, uh, realize that there is no other way to develop by, by, but, but like that. Your pipeline is code, freestyle jobs are dead. Remove them. Stop, ignore completely that their existence, they, they were, they are a I mean, they were great. The same way as uh, many things for my television was great 20 years ago and now I cannot look at it. Should I have a fast pipeline, 15 minutes, that should be your limit. If it's not 15 minutes, you need to rethink what you're doing and rethink hard. <laughs> Fixing a pipeline is always the highest priority. You cannot, you need to stop whatever you're doing and fix the problem first. You cannot ignore it, you cannot accumulate some percentages or have some, every Friday we fix problems. Problems are fixed immediately the same way as they are committed immediately and you will run your pipeline locally, you will let your developers have the ability, have three, four, maybe five commands that they will continuously execute on their laptops. You have Docker if you need a uh, way to deploy stuff on your laptop. Every laptop has a si 16 gigabyte of memory today, right? If your things cannot run on 16 megabytes, then go uh, back to that big pile of thing and rethink it. And you will commit only to the master branch or you will merge to the master branch at least once a day. If you don't do that, you know where you go. Now, a couple of you, some of you might be already there. Need to upload them. You're in heaven. You reach Nirvana. Excellent. The rest of you need to get your guts together. Start thinking how to do stuff better. I'm Victor. This is my blog, if you wanna read random nonsense. These are the books you need to buy immediately. <laughs> it's very important, because without them, there are two things, without those books you cannot do continuous delivery, it's impossible. <laughs> and without Jenkins Enterprise, you cannot do it either. Then I get some bonus, probably. Do I get the bonus if, no. Anyways, uh, Jenkins World, you have around 10 minutes for questions. They will be, uh, yes, 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 they will be, they, they are on my website. I published an article maybe two, two, two months ago. Just go there, search for it, commandments, you'll find it. Sorry? Yes, sure, sure, sure. You were not paying attention, is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, this, all your apps are doing. Yes. Uh, on one branch, on master, yes. Okay, so the question is if, if everybody commits to the same branch and you commit something, it might interrupt somebody else, right? Why would that interrupt? Because you committed something that doesn't work. Yeah, but everyone. If you commit all to the master, let's say five times a day, each of you, I'm going to extreme, right? And then there is a problem. Isn't that better finding the problem immediately than discovering it three months later? Okay, there is a something called feature toggle. So you can, you can write a simple if statement. If there is this flag, then don't show this feature, if that's the question. But your, your commit should be always operational. It should always work. You don't commit half of something, right? So the only question is whether what you committed should be visible to others or not. But it should well integrate with every, everything else. 
right? Assuming that your features are something manageable that is, that is done in a day, right? If you're talking about a feature that you need five months to develop and then you don't want to commit every day during those five months, then you have a problem of how you scope a feature, right? Yeah, no, but tog uh, feature toggles are used for your users. So if you want to deploy to production now something that is only halfway done, right? You want to disable that something for your users so they don't see it. But your, you yourself, your testers, whatever, can see it, of course. But that's for your end users, feature toggles. For your developers, uh, if you, if you, if first of all, if you work with Git, right? Uh, if, if I push something, and then you want to push something. Git will not allow you to push that something without pulling it and merging it locally first and then pushing it back. So you will get my changes, you will run your tests, you will validate that that works, and that's what Pipeline does. I'm not sure whether I answered the question. Okay, anybody else? Yes. Yes. Uh, Excluding maybe if you have uh, some performance tests that, that they might take longer and stuff like that. But yeah, we're talking about small services, 15 minutes commit to production. Don't have monolith. Uh, yeah, th th there are always exceptions. So uh, yes, sometimes you might reach half an hour, but make sure that all those things that really matter are in the first 15 minutes, right? Because if all your unit tests are passed and your, your functional tests passed and then you have something weird going on for 15 minutes, that's okay because most likely it's not gonna, uh, the point is that if you have a pipeline timeline, say pipeline runs like this, fastest, most important at the beginning, slower, less important, later, and so on and so forth. So you wanna get a feedback, possibly, most likely you're gonna get a bug report in unit tests, which is kind of like what it takes, a minute or two to run all your unit tests, that's how it should be, uh, assuming that everything is mocked and all those things, right? So unit tests should detect 95% of your problems, right? Uh, functional tests are there just to confirm that actually different features well integrate well together and so on and so forth. At if, it, if it's longer, make sure that actually fails at the beginning, most likely, yes. You say one of your tests did it, you were really following the Python manual, but all the code is there, so you learn it from manual yourself. You don't think that you need to run FDA and no, because FDY is telling you that. Every time he spoke to us, it was always 10. I don't know what's about that number. <laughs> it's always 10. <laughs> but the reason of the test is where you actually- Of course. All the time, all the time. I visit big companies which I cannot name, all the time. I know, I mean, this is, I understand, you cannot get kind of from 1999 to 2000, 2017 in two months, I understand that perfectly, kind of. But you need to understand where is your, what is your objective, where do you wanna go, right? And then you take your steps. You cannot skip history. The same thing as people ask me, I don't know, like, uh, how do we put this into containers? You don't know yet what virtual machines are, so <laughs> let's go. You need to go step by step throughout the history and get to present tense, just faster. So yes, of course, I mean, I, I know that uh, this is what, what, what I think should be done. Maybe there be, might be 11, there will be 11. I mean, things change all the time, that's the point. Uh, and I am fully aware that we cannot get, many of us cannot get there fast. I, I understand that, yes, please. No, you don't have one department across the uh, company to do deploy and stuff like that. You have multifunctional, uh, cross-functional teams that are in charge of the whole life cycle of a service. That's what you should have. And if you have one department that is in charge of deploying and stuff like that, and you probably open Jira tickets and wait for three days until you get the response, that's bad. Sorry, I interrupted your question. You can continue. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you can call it however you want. It's not, uh, what I wanna say is that there is a team, up to eight people, in charge of a service, application, whatever you wanna call it, and that, that means that from requirements, development, testing, in production, monitoring, 
you call them and Sunday when it fails. You don't call somebody else, right? So it's, it's a single team in charge of a service. And because that is very important among other reasons for responsibility. I built it, I run it, I check it, I do everything because I know what I did. If, if let's say, so for example, let's imagine role play, right? You're some infrastructure department and I have a service. I give you my service, say run it. You have no idea what it is. You, did, you have no idea how to run it. You, you don't know because it's not part of your work. Now, of course, you can have cross uh, horizontal departments as well, but they should be more in line of helping. Like, for example, I met a couple of cases where we say, we have a department that uh, uh, help people learn Kubernetes and Swarm and Mesos, right? You can run it in any of those. It's your service, your responsibility. I can help you. I will not do the work for you. Yes? So how do you deploy? I mean, I mean, if you're a very small company, then you might say, uh, I mean, you cannot not have operation experience. You might not need uh, full-blown operation experience because you say, okay, look, I'm going to deploy to Amazon or Azure or whatever. I'm going to rely on their services for load balancing for this or that, right? But you still need to, how do you package it? Right? You need to package something. You need to put it on a server. So some level of operational experience is needed. Now, of course, if you're small, you're not going to say 30% of, of five of us is going to be in operations. Right? I understand that completely, and you shouldn't. But some basic level you need, because if you don't know how it's going to be deployed, you don't know how to develop it either. Because all those things are related. The same thing is kind of if you're not testing it yourself, then your code will not be testable. Same thing with deployment. Yes. Yes, because, uh, yes, feature toggle introduce everything introduces some level of overhead. There is a slight overhead in feature, feature toggle because you need to write an if statement, <laughs> more or less. Uh, but I like that more because I, 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 I want to know as soon as possible when something does not integrate with something else, right? Uh, and, and putting everything to master simply is the, is the easiest and best way to do that. And I would rather hide the feature than, because then after that week, and even week is okay. If you said week, I can live with that. But usually it's not week. With you, maybe it is, but usually it's kind of like, oh, we have a feature. Three months, right? And after three months, uh, let's see, maybe it works. Who knows? Um, yes. Yes, I think it applies the same. Now, of course, deployment is different, like kind of, if it's a library, you don't deploy it to the live server, you deploy it to your repository, right? But it's still, yes, I, I think uh, it should be always in a state that, so if you're deploying library, you, you trust the system, you trust the process, you deploy it to your repository, and everybody else should be free to use the latest always. With my what? This one? I don't see myself from this slide. Huh? There are four, but one, uh, there, there is a fourth one, but it's about Java. I'm ashamed of that now. Uh, it's on LimpUp because it's 60% done. I, I, I publish it when it's in progress. I get feedback from readers and then continue. I don't know what I'm going to write in advance. So it's kind of, I apply the same principle to books. I, 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 I put, throw them to people as soon as there, is, there are a few chapters done. Anybody else? DevOps in general, high level, oh, oh many different things about DevOps, uh, Docker Swarm and Docker in details. Uh, Self-healing, self annotations self This is about creating a system that requires no humans. Works by itself, you go to vacation to Bali 
and that's first. That's the goal of that. Yeah. And the ripple back is uh, huh? And the ripple back is Ansible? No, Ansible is here. That was three years ago. Now I don't like it anymore. <laughs> Things change very fast. I believe that uh, Ansible is like all other configuration management tools are designed with static infrastructure in mind. If you want something equivalent to Ansible, uh, but works well in dynamic setting, I prefer uh, Packer with Terraform combination, which is, gives you the same result, just better. Yeah, here is Terraform, yes. Yeah, so whatever I tell you, I will tell you it's, not r it's wrong next year. <laughs> yes, that's how I offer it, yes. So this is awful, this, I don't believe in this anymore. <laughs> but you should buy it anyway. <laughs> Anybody else? To my tool chain? Yes, yes, I, I version, uh, chef, <laughs> sorry, uh, I'm kidding, uh, yes, yes, I try to apply it as much as possible. There are edge cases, and I think that that's, that's kind of, uh, whenever you hear somebody saying, you must do this, you must do that, you must use containers, you must use Jenkins, you must do this and that, the point is that everything is a tool in your tool belt, and you should, you should never adopt anything 100% nor discard it because for some reason, simply it's, it's, it's about being educated enough to know when something fits or something doesn't. For example, I'm a freak about TDD. I believe that TDD is the better thing than butter. Oh, and uh, I really apply it always, but there are cases I say, no, this, this does not make sense. You just, you should first master some tools, some process, and then only after that you say, this is when it applies, this, this is when it doesn't. All those things do not, those 10 commandments do not apply always, okay, that's the truth. But before you actually, you need to practice them all to know, you cannot decide which applies, which doesn't until you master them all. And then it depends from case to case. In most cases, I think, in most cases I would apply all of them. Sometimes I don't, it all really depends on yeah, circumstances. Build like yeah. Yeah. So uh, let, let's go. To, uh, say uh, when you say build tools, do you mean assemble tools or do you code tools? Okay. So yeah. Agile, meaning that as soon as you have something that, that makes sense, give it to somebody else. Don't wait for half a year until it's fully finished. Uh, refactor continuously, change tools. That's what I said earlier. I love Dansible, it was one of my favorite tools. I, I don't think it's great anymore. We should be able to ad adapt and change continuously to, to how things are done. I think that both apply. Uh, educate others, how to use your tools, how to do those things. You should be small. I don't know, you're a big guy, but I'm in team. Uh, <laughs> Practice test-driven development. Okay, if in some cases uh, you cannot write tests, maybe uh, if it doesn't, then don't, right? If it's, if it's your code, that you, if you, when you write your code, write tests before. If it's not your code, it's not your code, you need to trust test vendor, right? Uh, define CD as pipeline as code. Everything should be code if possible, no click, click, click. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't apply even for that, it applies to everything. Fast pipeline, if there is a pipeline, if there, if it, if you go back, if there is no test, there are no test, there is no test, there, are, there is no TDD, there is no pipeline, of course, unless you maybe only build it or uh, use common sense, no? Uh, when something fails, you fix it first. That applies always, I think. Uh, be able to run locally whenever that is possible. So if you're not talking about uh, mainframe uh, service and stuff like that, most things can run locally. You, sh you don't need a server for that. We have a lot of gigas now and commit only to master branch, uh, makes most of the time sense. Now, if you don't have tests, then don't commit to master branch uh, because uh, you need probably to, val if you need to validate manually, then of course you need the branch. That I understand. But anybody else? 
I don't know, what's my time? I'm still, I probably passed it for, who's coming after, I don't know. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> Go to that, let me make a picture of you guys. Now go to go to the application board for this session and know who you are.